Hey guys, I'm so excited that I figured out how to make my uh, face in a circle. <laughs> that is exciting. Uh, here I am in a circle. It's 5.2 video literary aspects in Sag Harbor. You know you love it. Let's talk literary aspects. Um, first of all, the unique narrative voice in this book. That's our first uh, literary aspect to trace. Um, the narrative voice is the voice of a 15 year old in 1985. And <clears throat> also the narrative voice is the voice of an adult who is looking back at his life as a 15 year old in 1985. And so you have to remember that um, uh, and, and how there is some kind of some tension in between those two um, those two voices. All right, so first of all, um, one aspect of this unique narrative voice is his use of hyperbole. Hyperbole is exaggerations, over the top exaggerations. And so here's a good example on page nine talking about uh, Benji and Reggie and how they have been um, so close, they're like conjoined twins. And this, of course, has a humorous effect, but we have to keep talking about the other types of effects that it has in order to really deal with this literary aspect completely. And we'll get there in a sec. Another thing that Benji does a lot and really well is self-deprecation. He makes fun of himself. He puts himself down. He makes himself seem less than, um, like this example of him being a buffoon on page 30. He's talking about his old bike that he's still uses. Um, and one of my favorite aspects about this voice is his direct addresses to the reader. He will speak directly to us as readers, um, asking us on page six, what do you see in this picture? And so using that you pronoun where he is actually speaking to the reader makes this a direct address. And he does this all, all over the place in all kinds of different ways. So watch for that. Parenthetical phrasing, um, the no one cared is the parenthetical phrasing here um, that he does uh, in this particular example. He, he does that a lot as well. Um, and then his use of explicit foreshadowing in this example on page 15 to 16. And he's saying this will be a running theme and that he's going to um, be in this uh, condition he's in for uh, a long time. Uh, is a good example of foreshadowing there. All right, well, what are some of the effects of this foreshadowing? I think it does show the tension between now and then. So then being the 1985, 15-year-old Benji, and now being the writer who's looking back on his life. And of course, it is still fiction. It's not um, exactly Colson Whitehead, you know, as the writer, even though we know that uh, this is loosely based on his life since he's called it an autobiographical novel. Um, but it reminds us, I think, that, that uh, how serious things seemed compared to how trivial they seem now. And I'm sure you've had this experience where you've looked back at something that happened to you when you were younger and you think about how traumatizing it was at the time. Um, and you think now, like, why was I so upset about that or so annoyed or so embarrassed or whatever it maybe was? Um, and I think the use of that voice does a good job of showing us the difference between now and then in some of these ways. I think it also invites the reader into Benji's interior life, uh, creating an informality or closeness with us. Um, and it also kind of feels rebellious, like we're part of him, you know, breaking the rules here as he directly um, uh, reaches out to us or explicitly foreshadows something. Um, it reminds the reader, too, of the complicated truths of adolescence, making us feel like, you know, we're in on Benny, Benji's inner reasoning, thoughts in life, and these things are not necessarily as simple as they might seem to an outward outside person, to an adult. Um, when he includes all of the parentheses and all of the details, we're reminded of how complicated things can be for a kid. All right, so let's talk about the next um, literary aspect, which is the use of naming. And he first 
um, uses this on page five when he says, my name is Ben. And we find out later that he's introducing a new self to us because everyone else calls him Benji. He also names others. Spider is given a capital S, of course, this um, girl who he uh, skates with on the, at the roller rink uh, does not go by this name. This is a name others have given to her. Um, he also likes to do these hyperbolic or exaggerative names of events, like the aforementioned plan. And of course, that's just talking about um, how he is trying to um, act older or more mature. The self-identifying markers are really fun, I think, in this book. Watch for them. Um, Reggie has these white filas that he's obsessed about keeping white, um, while Benji has black Chuck Taylors. Those are Converse uh, shoes. Um, he also talks about, um, as far as the handshakes, new slang, et cetera, um, about what he learns in his predominantly white school, right? Hacky sack and lacrosse stick versus what he has to learn from NP to get caught up on um, what he's missed out on the black culture, the technotronic bunny hop or the go-go bump stop, both of which I cannot find uh, after Googling. So maybe you guys can help me out with some research on those too. Um, the effects of all of this naming, well, I think first of all, it creates a new world for us, the readers, where Benji or whoever it is who's doing the naming is empowered. They have the power. Giving something a name gives that thing a power um, or gives that thing power. And being the one to name it gives the namer even more power. So there is a sense of power here, a way to try to maybe reclaim some power that has been lost. Um, and we as readers don't have that power. We have to look to Benji to try to understand what these names mean and what the significance of all of the things that are named is, are. Um, it also creates some intimacy, I think, with the reader. Um, we've been let in on this insider knowledge, and Benji lets us know that he doesn't know what all the names are, what all of the handshakes are, what all of these uh, labels are uh, either. And so by him telling us that and then informing us of some of them, it makes, it does create a certain kind of intimacy with us um, as readers. And it reminds the readers, I think, of the vastness of teenage knowledge. Um, you know, it, um, teenagers are often, you know, put down as not knowing anything, right? But think of all of the things that you know that your parents don't know. Um, it's incredible how much um, you guys have learned in your lives and you're 18 now and that's it. I'm much older and I, I don't have as much knowledge of the things that you know and I never will because it is specific to you. It is the kind of knowledge that by definition makes it important for you um, because it's what adults don't know, right? Slang, um, all of those kinds of cultural oddities that uh, you guys use that would sound stupid coming out of my mouth, right? Those are things that you know and that you are experts at and they're off limits really to adults or old people, I should say, so many of you are adults. Um, it shows the complexities of identities and choosing them too. Um, you know, how many different things are out there that create our identity and how we can choose them. How about the episodic structure? The episodic structure, the fact that it's organized by episode. Now this first chapter was organized um, based on the start of the summer, right? Benji and Reggie leave Manhattan with the parents for the summer in Sag Harbor. When they arrive, they find NP and start their summer antics. That is the time period of this first chapter. Um, but the chapter title, Notions of Roller Rink Infinity, is not actually from that current timeline. It's from a flashback two years prior when Benji is thinking about an experience he had on the roller rink, rink with a girl uh, when he was in eighth grade. And um, we find the uh, name of the chapter in uh, on page 15, where um, he's thinking about um, the nature of time, how to understand the universe and our place in it, and the changes that are coming as he sort of breaks from his brother. 
as an entity. How does one measure infinity in a roller rink is what he asks. So um, look at how the title of each chapter fits with what's being described and how it is uh, an, uh, an example of a profound kind of understanding, oops, I'm sorry, um, of, of, of something that's going on in his life or a memory that he has. It's a profound, there is something profound to it. Um, there's also something silly too, right? Something trite or not as profound like the roller rink. Um, also, we have a lot of asides. Benji uses that word. He says, one more aside about, um, at one point in this first reading, um, he has a lot of asides. He will take us meandering down different thoughts and flashbacks and commentaries about life. Um, pages five to 17, those, none of those pages are about the current timeline. It's just flashbacks, asides, and even the title of the chapter is about a flashback. And so that a aspect of the book um, is important. I think that there are connections between what's happening in the flashbacks and what's happening in the current timeline um, and all of the other things that he adds. And, and looking for those is going to be key to understanding the book. Uh, what are the effects of the episodic structure? Well, I think the organization follows the summer, giving us this slice of life feeling where we're just, um, you know, experiencing one summer in the life of one teenager in one place. Um, and these things are, you know, relaxing. It's a, it's a vacation time. But at the same time, Benji is dealing with all kinds of nerve wracking um, experiences as well. Um, the order seems unplanned, spontaneous, as we follow the conversational organization of Benji's mind talking to us, the reader, and we go along for the ride. Um, the title of each chapter focuses on something profound and trite, notions of infinity and a roller rink, um, some idea or memory that reminds us of the musings of a 15-year-old, which are as real as any adult's thoughts, um, but are also grounded in the life of a 15 year old, which might seem a bit trite for us reading it now as adults or almost adults. All right, examples of the motif of navigating analytical tools. This is a, a mouthful. I don't think I put analytical in yours. I think I just put navigating, but I like analytical because it's not just navigation of places, but also of language. And I think analytical works better there, but I mean, we could say navigating too. All of the things that he makes use of in his sort of toolbox to navigate his world, to analyze the things that are going on around him so that he can find his place. Um, he analyzes language in this way. Here's an example of him saying that, you know, using this, um, using this out language is actually a way of referencing prison as if our lives in Manhattan are the prison and being here in Sag Harbor is furlough where we're, uh, you know, on a brief respite or um, break from prison. Um, he also uses equations a lot. He does this with the title, right? You can test the universe by asking questions. Um, and then he lists all of these, these ways that you could ask questions that are really kind of like equations um, to understand how big infinity is. And then he comes down to it on this page that it will, the number two is what was important. Um, and on page 38, he says, I had to observe and gather information. And he'll be doing this all summer long. So watch for references to compasses, equations, binoculars, maps, things like that for this particular motif. And also how he analyzes language like the word out in that first um, example. What are the effects? I think the reader is reminded that Benji's trying to find his place in this world. Um, it creates a feeling of uncertainty as he's lost and, and meandering and navigating. But then there is a hope too, that like if he, if he gloms onto the right thing, it, you know, if he analyzes enough, if he observes enough, he will find the answer, um, the way to be. Um, it suggests that Benji doesn't have a lot of role models too to learn from as he's looking for answers outside of people. He's looking for these things that he's been taught are important, like analyzing language, um, coming up with equations, 
um, from math and science um, and all of these other tools that are beyond looking for a model or um, a person to uh, use to understand life. Um, allusions to popular culture. This is a, um, a, a fun one for me, maybe not so much fun for you since you didn't live it. Um, we have a bunch of songs throughout, um, talks about radio stations in this first reading. I didn't catch any TV shows or celebrities, but you can watch for those as you keep reading. Um, movies, of course, Star Wars. And um, the effects of all of these, well, they create a feeling of nostalgia. Um, it reminds the reader that of the fleeting nature of popularity and importance, you know, that some things seem so important one day and then the next, they, they are not as important or not as popular. And I think we also feel sort of bombarded with all of these names. Um, and that might parallel Benji's feelings of, you know, like I was saying in the last, with the last literary aspect of navigating his world where he's kind of lost or wayward, um, finding his way. All right, I hope this is helpful to you and I didn't get too long-winded. Oh, I don't know what happened there. But uh, anyway, enjoy reading the second chapter. Thanks.